Proverbs, we read, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just <coughs> and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the saying and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And from Luke we read, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Thank you, Carol. I was just musing while we were waiting for the little video on Financial Peace University to come up. I was just musing, maybe we need a, a technological peace university <laughs> on one of these days. Um, and I have a suspicion that a lot of the wisdom that Dave Ramsey imparts, um, or at least in, in, in some measure, was gleaned from what we're going to be talking about here in these messages in the next several Sundays. So good morning. Um, I, I'd like to share with you that the week before last, Ofa and I went to see a movie. Now that in itself is, you know, a big deal, you know. We don't go to that many movies. We went to see Darkest Hour. Maybe you've heard about it. It's about Winston Churchill's elevation to Prime Minister of Great Britain just at the moment when Hitler's Nazi armies had overrun Europe and were actually threatening to invade England. Now, throughout his time in office, Churchill was a somewhat controversial figure, and he faced opposition from every corner, including his own political party. Ch Churchill exemplified principled integrity, respect, and uh, even wit in the face of this opposition. During his last year in office, he attended an official ceremony. Several, ro several rows behind him were two gentlemen who began whispering during the ceremony. That's Winston Churchill. They say he's getting senile. They say he should step aside and let more dynamic, capable men run the nation. When the ceremony was over, Churchill turned to the men and he said, Gentlemen, they also say he is deaf. This man was filled with witty and often wise sayings. Here's one of his more famous ones. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. I kind of admire his insight into history and human nature and his ability to wisely steer a course through times of anxiety and conflict. His was a practical kind of wisdom and understanding that leads to wise living. And that's what this book of Proverbs is all about. For the next several weeks, we're going to be diving into this book of Proverbs, not the entire book, there's 31 chapters, but pieces of it here and there, to help us focus on this this often overlooked to the Bible, often overlooked book of the Bible. So 
So let's begin with asking, what is this book really about? Well, if you read the first chapter of Proverbs, it tells you. You know, when I begin reading from Proverbs, here's what comes to my mind. Too soon old, too late wise. I should have been absorbing more of this book's wisdom when I was much younger. But of course, uh, as is so often the case when you're much younger, you don't have much interest in these kinds of things. How striking it was that Jesus, even as a boy, had absorbed enough wisdom to impress the great teachers. Proverbs is a book that deals with the theory and practice of wisdom. It's the kind of wisdom, now get this, that comes from God and is characterized by insight, knowledge of divine truth, and the resolution to thoughtfully apply these qualities. Wisdom is really God's gift. And it is developed by constant search for divine truth. The Lord gives wisdom. Knowledge and understanding come from his mouth. Although this book was written some 3,000 years ago, it's amazingly relevant today, filled with practical and down-to-earth advice. You know, back in the ancient world, memorization was a common method for teaching and for learning. And so short statements that distilled great truths into a few words were most helpful in the learning process. A well-turned phrase is easier to remember than a complex law or theological doctrine. So a proverb, then, is a short statement that takes the place of a long explanation. For example, we have proverbs in our own culture. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now just, you know, just spew that out to your kids sometime your teenagers especially, and then explain it to them. What does it mean? Or how about this one? Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Try explaining that to your teenagers. No, forget it. Doesn't work. <laughs> you know, most cultures have proverbs. I used to know quite a few of the proverbs of my wife's home country of Tonga, like Sayang e Sinaki i Toki which means it's better to be prepared than to do last minute. But I always laugh when I hear that stated because my experience in Tonga is most people do it the opposite of that. So, but the difference here with the Proverbs of the Bible is that they teach us how to live life skillfully from God's point of view. For example, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Or this one, maybe you've heard. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. The Proverbs of the Bible are principles, not promises, telling us how to live in a godly manner through the choice of the best ends and the best means for their attainment. So it's it's about right knowledge for living. Living in a godly manner means, first, choosing the right goals for your life and then using the best avenues to reach those goals. This is about right knowledge, the knowledge, really, that comes from God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So I suppose you could call that the theme of the book of Proverbs. It's repeated again later on in chapter 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now you could chew on that one for a while. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Let's look at the first verse there that I mentioned. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The most important word here is beginning. Remember last week's message? Does anybody remember last week's 
message. I talked about the connection between creation and Christmas, between the book of Genesis and the Gospel of John. The first words of Genesis and the Gospel of John are, in the beginning. There's three things that this word beginning conveys here in the Bible. First of all, it means that which is first priority, basic, foundational. You can't begin without it. The second thing the beginning means is that which is the, the essence or central truth of something. So you can't construct anything without it. And thirdly, it means that which is the essence Oh, excuse me, that which is the capstone or the ultimate goal of something. It won't be complete without this. So that's what the beginning of knowledge is fear of the Lord. And what is fear of the Lord? Well, it's not a cringing terror. It's really about respecting God for who he is. It's understanding at a soul level that God is God and you are not. Respect for God is where knowledge begins. He made the whole world and he runs it according to his plan, not according to mine or yours. Knowledge begins in God and it is where all knowledge ends up. So if you seek wisdom, you've got to begin with reverence for God for God is foundational, is the central core, and really the ultimate goal of wisdom. So an attitude of devotion to God is essential to becoming wise in the ways of living rightly. Now let's take a look at that last part of the verse. It's a contrast to the first part. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now there are about five different words in the book of Proverbs that are translated by the word fool. So why so many fools? Maybe you've heard that saying. What's the difference between genius and stupidity? Genius has its limits. <laughs> so in Proverbs, there is the young fool, the naive fool, the gullible fool, the angry fool, and so on and so on. And then there is the arrogant, stubborn, hard-headed fool who will not listen to anybody's advice. That's the word that's used here. Three things we could say about that kind of fool. He doesn't know what he's doing, he doesn't care, and he isn't willing to learn. The contrast to that is there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know, because a wise person will say that all the time. I don't know. Could you show me how? Could you teach me? I don't know, but I'd sure like to learn. I don't know. Can you help me here? But the fool says... By his attitude and actions, says, well, I don't know, I don't care, I don't really want to learn anything, and you can't teach me anyhow. So, wise living leads to virtuous living. I think, you know, we have a lot of problems in our culture, in our society, in our churches, and a lot of it is due to a lack of virtue among people. And yet, God desires that his people be a holy people to live in discernment and prosperity, pursuing ethical and moral behavior as a consistent witness to the value of obedience to God. I mean, that's the reason God chose the Jews in the first place, is that they would model what obedience to him produces in life and thereby be a, a witness, an example to the nations around them. God's people are to live virtuous lives and spread virtuous influence throughout society. That's one of the reasons we've been praying about and asking all of us to get to know our neighbors where we live. I mean, at least start with an acquaintance, know some names of those people who live around you because we are to be agents of God's virtue influencing society. The moral teachings of Proverbs are meant to relate the believer's faith successfully to life in society not just in church. With divine wisdom, the believer can confidently address today's social and economic concerns. I mean, if you're afraid of people, it will trap you. But if you trust in the Lord, he will keep you safe. 
The Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. That's the source. Seeking after God will develop your moral insights. The pearls of wisdom in this book are for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. You might translate this phrase to mean, oh, with, with the knowledge of the Lord, you're going to get some street smarts and know how to work with all kinds of people in all circumstances and get things done. And it's not just a matter of getting things done in the world's way, but it means getting things done in a godly manner so that you're doing what is right and just and fair. Proverbs is about learning what God has said about what is right and wrong. And it's also practical, down-to-earth teaching about how you ought to treat people, how you really ought to be living, how your behavior ought to be different if you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ. For a world that has lost its way, God provided this book to show us the right way. The wisdom of Proverbs will develop virtuous people who will bless all of those around them. Now, I mentioned also prudent living. To follow the way of divine wisdom is going to bring numerous benefits to your living. That doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake. It just means that with the, the wisdom of Proverbs, maybe you'll avoid some of the pitfalls of life and relationships that can bring you and others so much grief. And along the way, I guarantee, if you stick with studying the Proverbs, you'll gain mental alertness. As it says there, for understanding words of insight and for understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise, by reading this book, you'll be sharper mentally than you are right now. Guarantee you. You read some of those phrases, some of those verses, in Proverbs, and you go, oh, hey, and you'll have to work at understanding what's being conveyed there. You'll also begin to, dare I say it, grow up. For giving prudence to the simple, it says, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance. Now, the, the simple that's referred to in this verse does not mean those of low IQ or mental deficiency. It refers to those who are prone to either being naive or gullible, falling for the same thing over and over again, or those who simply can't seem to learn from their mistakes. Unfortunately, there are people who make the same mistakes over and over again throughout life. They get into the same bad relationships over and over again. They make the same bad investments over and over again. They say the same foolish things over and over again. They hurt their friends in the same way. They make promises that they can't keep. They, they, they start out trying to do something for everyone and take on everything. And they bite off more than they can chew and they have to back off and be embarrassed over and over again. Maybe, maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. This book will teach you how to break the cycle of wrong decisions. Maybe you make wrong decisions over and over again with money. Read the book of Proverbs and go to Financial Peace University. Break that cycle. This book will teach you how to get on the right path. If you follow the Lord from the time that you're young, by the, old, by the time you're old, you'll be wise. You may, not, you may not start out that way. You may start out foolish or arrogant or selfish, but the older you get, the wiser you ought to become. Now, it's not strictly chronological, you know, but by, by age 30 say, you, you ought to wise up and start living the way God says you ought to live. I, I know for some people it takes longer than others. It's taken me a long time. That's why this book is here, to help the young know how to grow up 
morally, ethically, and spiritually. So let's talk about the benefits of wisdom. And as I said, in the coming weeks, we're going to dive into different pieces, different parts. We're not going to go through the entire book, but different pieces and parts. So what are the benefits from this biblical, this godly kind of wisdom? What can you take away, even from this introduction of Proverbs? Here's three things I think we could take away. The first one is this. The wisdom offered in this book leads to a temple, not a palace. The quest for true wisdom leads back to God. And any quest or learning that leads away from God and his word is headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> Interesting. I'm thinking of uh, a time when we lived up there in the Bay Area near Stanford University, and there were two men on our, lived on our street who were physicists at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And um, one of them had a, a son who was in our daughter's uh, elementary and middle school classes. And he invited us over to the house for dinner one evening and invited the other gentleman across the street who worked with him at Sanford Linear Accelerator. And I was just fascinated by their work. I was asking what they did there, what it was all about, what was going on. They were shooting these atomic particles down this long tunnel and calculating all this stuff and all that figure out. Well, the gentleman from across the street was, you know, he was very enthusiastic, explaining to me all that they were doing in the process and everything like that, seeking the, to understand the origins of the universe. And he just kept explaining this and that. And then finally he kind of smiled and he says, you know, I guess when you get down to it, we're, we're looking for God. I thought that was profound, interesting from this scientist. All true learning begins with the understanding that there is a God to whom we must all one day give an account. Here's the second takeaway from this introduction to Proverbs. Education that leaves out God really omits the central principle of the universe. Many of those who founded our public school system in America years ago were, well, if they were not practicing Christians, at least, <coughs> at least they believed At least they believed in a Judeo-Christian principle and the truth of the Bible as a foundation for learning. Thank you. So, if you uh, look back to readers reading books in elementary schools in this country back in the 19th century, the, the McGuffey readers, for example, you'll see that they taught the ABCs like this. A, all have sinned. B, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. C, confess your sins and you will be forgiven. And so on and so on. Education had a biblical foundation. So what do you think would happen if a teacher taught that way in public schools today. <laughs> I remember my son's sixth grade teacher. <laughs> he used quotes to help teach ancient history to the kids. And he had up on the board a proverb from the Bible with the ascription King Solomon. Solomon was a historical figure. If you go today to the public schools in my wife's country of Tonga, uh, it's not at all unusual to see Bible quotes in poster print or written on the blackboard there in the classroom. Because uh, there's still a, a belief there that knowing God and about God is foundational to learning. You know, you, you can teach reading, writing, and arithmetic, but if God is left out, you've left out the most important thing. When you take God out of the equation, there's really no basis for a moral conscience. Think about that. If there is no God, think it through. All things are permissible. That's why bringing your children here to Sunday school is all the more important than ever. God, creator and redeemer, is the one who brings order out of chaos. And when you take God out of the educational system, out of society, what are you going to get? Chaos. No crime legislation, no bureaucratic solution can solve the problems of our society. 
our society's ills will be healed only when we come back to what the Bible taught 3,000 years ago. And by the way, just because we may have technological sophistication doesn't mean, and, and those who 3,000 years ago didn't have all the technological sophistication doesn't mean they didn't have wisdom. In fact, I think they may have had more wisdom than we do today. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Just let me pause here for a moment and say this. To every Christian teacher, staff member, coach, administrator, professor in our public school systems, in our university systems, I want to say, God bless you. You are missionaries. I do, yes, support Christian schools. As a matter of fact, our church has one, uh, our, our preschool back there. And I'm also behind all those working in the public schools. Education is invaluable, but here is the underlying truth. You can be an intellectual genius and still be a spiritual moron. You can be an intellectual giant, but a moral midget. All the book learning, you can have more degrees than Phoenix in the summertime. But none of those are of avail if you have not the fear of the Lord. Without reverence for God, you're still in spiritual kindergarten. Now let's go to the last takeaway from this introduction to Proverbs. God blesses those who build their lives on the firm foundation of his eternal truth. I believe that. And I encourage you to believe it and do it. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. Diligence in seeking God's wisdom will blossom in your life in time. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. That's one for each day of our longer months. I have read that the great evangelist Billy Graham has made it his lifelong habit to read one chapter of Proverbs each day. Just think of the wisdom that he's absorbed over the years. How he has perhaps been equipped by that to be consistent, full of integrity and honesty his entire life. If you and I began that practice, just think of the wisdom that we would gain together in the coming year. How, how would we say it? A, a proverb a day keeps the stupid away? <laughs> Something like that? So I say, why not? Let's do it. Let's read a chapter of Proverbs each day. Hey, it's like any other Bible reading you said to do. You miss a day, you make up for it the next day. You know, you miss a meal, you don't keep starving yourself. So let's, let's go back to God's word, and let's get wisdom. And then you will understand how to have respect for the Lord, and you will find out how to really know God. Amen.